demonstration of something not alive before we actually talk about what's going on inside of us. So we all recognize that there is a finite amount of air in this balloon, right? Uh, it's tied, so no more air can come in. It, it's not porous, so the air is not pouring out. And we know that there's some kind of pressure in here. But by sitting just by itself like this, what's the likelihood that this balloon is going to pop? Not very likely, right? Even the president knows the answer to that one. Yes, it's a no. Okay, but what can we do to increase the chances it would pop? I could squeeze it. Now, I'm not going to pop it in case everyone's going to freak out. Don't freak out. But when I squeeze it, when I squish it down, I'm taking the air in there and I'm squishing it into a smaller space and I'm increasing the pressure. I'm making the pressure higher so that maybe, in fact, it could pop. We, as humans, tend to think of pressure as a bad thing. But it actually, as an anatomist, pressure is so important. We have to have pressure in the body in order for things to move. Right? So my discussion is going to really be on the movement of two different kinds of substances. A gas, which for us is air. That's what moves in and out of our body. That's what we and a liquid. What's the major liquid that moves around the body? Blood. Good. Yes. And that's our liquid that moves through. Okay, so for both of those, even though they seem very different to you, right, for both gases, and I'm going to write air here, and liquid, and we're really concentrating on blood here, for both of those, there's two rules that kind of govern movement. And both of them have to do with pressure. Okay, so the first one is very logical, right? Pressure always wants to go from where it is higher to where it is lower. Right? We want to release pressure. And we can easily measure pressure using different um, instruments. But whatever the pressure is, it's always going to move in that direction. That's our first rule. Our second rule is that substances move. Again, both liquids and gases. When there is a difference in pressure. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean that we cannot have equal pressures in two places if we want substances to move. So I'm going to give you an example. Oftentimes when we talk about this, we think of the body as a series of tubes. Because it, it really is, right? This tube could be some kind of a blood vessel somewhere in our body. This tube could be part of our bronchial system, right? Part of the structures that form our lungs. So what I'm saying to you is that whatever the pressure is over here needs to be different than the pressure over here, the other end of the tube, in order for substances, gases or liquids, to flow or to move. We also know, because I just told you that, that we need a difference, right? We need high and low. So our substance would move in that direction, from the higher end to the lower end. OK. Now, I'm actually going to start out talking about air and giving you an example of how this movement occurs, because I really can't give you that an example. I can't 
to show it to you um, in terms of blood. But we'll start out with breathing and then we'll move on to um, the heart, right? And the movement of blood. Okay, so around us, the air is a mixture of gases, right? That we breathe in all the time. And so we just refer to it as the atmosphere. That's what we're gonna call it. the pressure of the atmosphere around us, we use a barometer, and we measure it in nanometers. Okay, and M. So it's, it's pretty stable, the pressure of the atmosphere around it, us, and I, I'm going to just throw out a number at you, I hope you're not people who hate numbers but it is 760 nanometers. That's the standard atmosphere pressure. Okay, where could we go that that pressure would be very different than 760 nanometers? Okay, space, that's a great example. Good, where else? Underwater, right? You have to go pretty deep down. Good. And the opposite of that, somewhere between Earth and space. Where else? Mouth, right. You have to very much change your elevation, and then the pressure would change. Now, we don't do this on a regular basis, right? You're not going to run up the mountain to breathe in and out, run back down. We're not going to do that or go into space or dive deep under the ocean. So let's go with the pressure of the atmosphere is steady or stable. So in order for you to breathe, you have to change the pressure in the body. You have to change the space. I'm actually gonna turn this around. Should I just turn the whole thing around? Yeah. I'm gonna go with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to give me a little more space, Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this for you. So atmosphere is 760 nanometers. If I want air to enter my lungs, so I want to breathe in, the pressure in my chest cavity, in my lung area, has to be bigger or smaller than 760. Right. So it has to be less than, I won't even use the symbol. Some people hate the symbols. 760 nanometers. Because I want to go, I'm always going from high to low. Okay? So we're going from atmosphere to lungs. All right. What happens when you breathe in? When you breathe in, and I'm going to exaggerate, you are totally changing the cavity and the space, more so than you even realize. Because when you breathe in, you are using your muscles, your, even the area between your ribs spreads, the tubes even spread, so you are greatly changing the space. Change space, which is going to lower the pressure. Now, it doesn't lower a huge amount. Because most times we don't breathe like that. <gasps> That's not how you're taking every breath. You're actually it's hard to even see people breathe sometimes. Nursing trip, you put your hand on someone's shoulders to check how often they're breathing. Because if you just stare at them, which is also a little rude, it's hard, it's sometimes hard to do, okay? Okay, so honestly, on average, when you breathe in, the pressure in the atmosphere, 760, moves into your lungs 
which the pressure is 758 maybe. That's it. One or two tiny degrees lower than what's in the atmosphere. Okay? So we change the space to change the pressure so the air will go in. Okay, and then what happens? You're like a giant accordion. You know, it's a very old instrument, or you're like me squeezing the balloon, right? Because here you are. So to breathe out, you squeeze down, right? You press in. If you squeeze down, we use muscles again. We make the tube smaller so that we are increasing the pressure. Again, not by much. When you breathe out, the pressure in the lungs is about 761. That's it. But it's higher than the atmosphere, which that's not changing. You certainly don't change it by breathing. And again, we're still going high to low. Okay, so now I have another question. Please stop me if you have a question. Okay, I'm sorry. Do we spend every second of our lives breathing in and out? Someone said yes. If you did, you sound like a dog. You'd be panting, right? And, and you got quite ill, actually. <laughs> so, no, the answer is no. We do not spend every second breathing in and breathing out. There's pauses between. So now, let's go back to my original statement. So I don't want to get this around. But I'll turn it around again. Okay, so my original statement is that you have to have a difference in order for movement, again, of air or liquid. So I'm saying to you that there's a period of time when we're not breathing in, we're not breathing out, and therefore, there's no pressure difference. Okay, this can be demonstrated, right? Can't, again, not with blood, but we can with air. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to tell you before I do it. I'm going to take a breath in, and I'm going to stop. I'm not going to breathe out. I'm not going to be breathing in. I'm just going to be in between, all right? So breath in. Right here, this state right here, where I'm not breathing in and I'm not breathing out. But I can only stay this way so long, and eventually I have to take another breath. <laughs> okay? But during that time... The pressure is equalized between the atmosphere and your lungs and nothing else and nothing is moving. Just to demonstrate that that really does happen and we do have that state. Okay. All right, let me catch up with myself for just a minute. Um, okay. All right, I'm gonna switch gears now to the heart. And before I even uh, look at this guy here, I want to ask a question. Um, back in oh, second grade, maybe, you learned if someone said to you, why does blood, don't answer this, Dr. Penton, why does blood move through the body? What would your answer be? Why does your blood move? That's the reason, but what's the force behind why your blood moves? Your heart's pumping. Your heart, because it's a pump. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? You weren't wrong. I just wasn't the question I was asking. Um, the heart is a pump, and it pumps and pushes the blood through. Absolutely. All right, so in order for me to talk about this with you, I did bring a model of a heart. This is much larger than our heart. Your heart's a little bit bigger than your fist, right? So this is enlarged so we can see things. And I'm going to, um, I want to use this just as a demonstration of um, very few parts. I'll also share with you that it's sitting like it would sit in me. So whenever you 
um, work on anything anatomical, you're concerned with the organ or the subject based on their side. So this is the right side and this is the left side, just like it was sitting. Okay? So I'm going to open it up. And most of us know that the heart is composed of four chambers, right? We as humans um, have a four chambered heart. Not all animals have four chambers, but we do. So the upper chambers are the upper smaller chambers called atria, right? So here's the atria over here, and here's the atria over here. And the larger lower chambers are called ventricles. Here's the ventricle over here, and here's the ventricle over here, right? Blood flows in only one direction in these chambers from the upper atria to the lower ventricles. So part of you might think, well, that's logical because it's with gravity, upper to lower. But we also have help. We also have valves, right? So valves have one huge purpose, actually in the whole body. You have a bunch of valves other places. They prevent backflow. That's their job. So think of them, these little flaps, as doors that only open in one direction. We want to be sure that when blood goes from the upper atria to the lower ventricle, that there's no slosh back there, right? That it doesn't slide back at all. It stays in one direction. Okay, everybody okay with this? So the white structures in my model are representing um, these valves that sit, again, between the atria um, and the ventricle. Most of us recognize that the heart has two beats. And although it doesn't sound technical at all, it's referred to as lub-dub. That sounds very technical, doesn't it? So whomever named it that, I don't know, some cardiologist or heart anatomist who knows how long ago, they went on that that's the sound the heart makes when it contracts or beats. And in order to talk about how blood moves, I want you to understand the difference between these two beats, okay? So what's going to happen, and I'm going to kind of go over this and then we're going to look at the model, is blood is going to fill both atria. So blood is going to come in from the body and into these um, upper, into the two upper chambers. And when they're filled, and the fill word is really important, they're going to squeeze, like you squeeze a tube of toothpaste. They're going to contract And we're going to push the blood into the ventricles. Oops. Sorry. That's our first contraction, or essentially our lub. two bottom areas, the two bottom chambers, 
are filling. So the ventricles are filling. And again, I can't tell you how important that word is, the filling, after they're filled, then the ventricles contract. And they push the blood out of the heart, right? To outgoing arteries. Arteries are easy to remember. Just remember, A is for a way. They're always, they're a type of vessel that's always going to carry blood away from the heart. A for away. Okay? Now, this second squeezing of the ventricles is our second heart sound, our second uh, contraction, our dub. Okay. So again, we fill our upper chamber, we fill our atria, they squeeze and contract, love, they push the blood into the lower ventricles, they squeeze and contract, and the blood exits the heart, the arteries. It is very, very critical that there's love, pause, you couldn't have all four chambers squeeze at once. If all four chambers squeeze at once, the blood doesn't move and the heart flutters, right? It's a, a terrible situation. It's a pathological situation. Remember, back to our pressure conversation. So for this to happen, we're building up the pressure in the atria so that the blood moves to the ventricles and then we're building, we're squeezing, we're just like the balloon, we're building up the pressure in the ventricles so again, the blood exits. Okay, questions on that? All right, now, I am gonna share with you, as I shared with uh, Dr. Lang, my, I, am, I do not have a clinical background, right? So I'm not, um, a, a nurse or a medical doctor that deals with pathological problems. I am a person who deals with the normal situation. But in order for you to understand, really, how important this whole pressure thing is, I do want to talk about a very common pathology that happens, unfortunately, in a huge number of people. So again, we're keeping in mind, we're never forgetting the in initial original pressure rules of you gotta go from higher to lower and you have to have a difference. So this system works great if a person's blood pressure, the pressure we measure in your vessels, is at a normal level. But we know one of the largest problems, especially in the U.S., is hypertension, which is the fancy word for high blood pressure. All right? And this hypertension, high blood pressure, is technically 140 over 90 or higher, right? This is measured in your vessels in your vessels. So, what happens with a person with hypertension? Here's the ventricles trying to squeeze. Remember that they've got to overcome, they've got to have more pressure than in outgoing vessels. And a person with hypertension, the heart has to overwork. It has to work so much harder and squeeze so much more because it's pushing against it, right? Here's the ventricle, and here's the artery. And honestly, you've got to have higher over here. 
here, it's honestly like, almost like it's pushing back, not letting you open the door and the blood to move through. And in a severe situation, it can. It can't push. And therefore, the blood isn't flowing, and therefore, unfortunately, the person goes into a crisis and or death. So I, I, I know that most people don't understand why that is so bad and what kind of effect it has, and it really can weaken the heart and cause damage in that. All right. Okay, so honestly, that's kind of all I prepared because I didn't know if you had questions. And I know it's a lot. Um, you know, there's always, I hate science people. Any good I hate science people? Dr. Penny kind of hate science, did you know that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions uh, if you have them. Yeah. 